Hello, I'm Fred McNeil, and you're watching QAC TV7. Thank you very much for being with us. The program you're watching is called Fireside Chat. Now, what we're going to do in this program, we're interviewing the newly elected county commissioners first and then other officials in the county. And the purpose of the program is you get to know them as individuals, where they went to school, what they've done in the community, that type of thing. We're not going to debate politics or talk politics, but we want you to get an up-close and personal look at these people. So when you have to pick up the phone, you can say, hey. I know something about them. Uh, the first show we had was Commissioner Jim Moran. I'm pleased to say today we have Commissioner-elect Steve Wilson. Steve, thank you very much for being with us on what is a dreary, cold Thanksgiving Eve day. So thanks for coming out. More than welcome, dear sir. And thank you, folks. Good. Steve, here's what we do. Let's go back. Let's go way back to the beginning here. Uh, what year were you born in? We'll start. Ninth, oh, boy. Back before World we're War II. We're giving away all the secrets no, here. This, okay. No secret to it. All you'd have to do is look at me okay, and you'd know okay. the rock of ages here. I was born in 1939 in New York City. Okay, so tell us, start, let's start from there. Let's start the Steve My Wilson gracious, story. you mean okay. how I left the hospital for Well, well, well we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. What, who, why were you, what were mom um, and dad doing in New York or who were you with, that type of thing? Uh, mom and dad, uh, my parents, my grandparents actually were German immigrants who came here in 1904-05 and... They had a very successful and large business enterprise in Germany, and my grandfather was sent here with adequate funds to start a factory, and he did. And so my parents worked in our family business okay. in New York City, and I was born there. And we then lived in Montclair, New Jersey for a number of years, and I went to public school through the fifth or sixth grade so okay. I started out in public school okay let's go back let's go back early memories of school my gracious I mean that's that's the yeah. fun of it I, do, favorite I do remember going yeah. off well a thing which you should know about me is you yeah. might have noticed I'm missing a few fingers here that okay. when I was four years old and strolling off to pre-kindergarten I get run over by a car mm. and this was slightly before Penicillin had become, it had been invented, but was not yet on the market. And so before long, in those days, people very regularly got horrible infections. In the world wars, they got gangrene and lockjaw. Well, so did I, age four. And so I went to the hospital for six months. And so now when I appeared in school, my first grade, I was... Uh, minus one arm, which was an embarrassment, you know, when you're a kid, if you even have a pimple, yeah, it's a bad day. Well, this was, this was a bad day, so, it, it, you know. But I went off to school, and I was a rather indifferent student. As we all, I think <laughs> no, we all were, yeah. There are some kids that wonderfully hit the ground running, but okay. I hardly hit the ground at all. I was right. slow off my blocks, so... That said, I uh, went on through public school and into private school, and I don't know how detailed you want well, that. Well, let's keep, let me, let me skip yeah. back in. Tell me yeah. a little bit about uh, mom and dad. I mean, they worked for the family business. Dad, big, who was the boss of the family? Who was the biggest influence on you? Both, neither, mm. grandparents, what? Yeah, this was a big business. Okay, so, so they were busy. Well, my father was busy. I mean, this was actually just prior to or actually post-World War II. And they, I mean, this was a pretty big factory. It had like several thousand people working there. So okay. anyway, we lived in a very nice compound in New Jersey, my sisters and I did. And then somewhere in the 1940s, my parents decided they didn't want to only live in the New York area. And so they bought a property here. Okay, on the Eastern Shore. On the Eastern Shore. In fact, where I'm now residing, they bought in 1943. And so by 1944, I was living in Queen Anne's County on weekends and summers. So this was a getaway spot? It was at first. You, you mentioned, I mean, you said, you mentioned sisters. How about, tell me about sisters. I have two sisters, once three, one got killed in a car accident. And uh, my two sisters live, one here 
and another in Vermont, and she is a school teacher okay, okay. and a teacher of teachers. So. All right, yeah. okay. Okay, so yeah. we're uh, family business in New Jersey, New York. Yep, and uh, that, that persisted up until probably the early 1950s. And by then, if you were in the textile business, which my family was, they were manufacturers of fancy women's wear woolen goods. The business began to move down south, but my parents were not very Darwinian, and they did not move down south. <laughs> the factories moved to where labor was cheap, but my family was not about to move anywhere. So basically the business went off downhill and finally was sold off, and my parents moved here full-time in 1952. Okay. And at that point, I became a citizen of Queen Anne's, I guess. Now, at that point, uh, private schools, public schools? Private school all the way from when I was 11 years old. I went here, to here in the county. No, 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 I was. I went to one up in Connecticut, and I went to Lawrenceville, and another one called New Preparatory School, and then off to University of Virginia. Okay. Well, before we go to UVA, uh, think of your uh, kind of middle school, junior high, high school years. What'd you do? I had a rather mixed career. I, uh, <laughs> other kids fit rather smoothly in school. That is not the case with me. I, okay. I was not an easy student. I did not fit. This was the <clears throat> rather, um, I don't know, it was, it was just, uh, I had a rather difficult growing sure. up. Sure. And it was not until I had got into college that things began to sort of come together for me. Okay, well, let's go there. Let's jump to the moon of the state. No, I'm no, happy no, to okay. go through the, oh, you okay. know, I was, sure, okay. I, every year I would sort of barely get into the next grade. Right. But along the way, I mean, you have to rem remember that we're now in the middle 50s. Television had hardly got on the scene, and I became an inveterate heavy reader okay, right. of almost everything. Okay. And that fiction, nonfiction, everything. 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 Okay. Yeah. Favorite and author that comes to mind, or authors? Evelyn, probably Evelyn War. You know, okay. I liked anything that made me laugh or was right. interesting. Adventures. Okay. When James Bond came out, that was. You great. read all the o seven books, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every one. Good. Okay. I could. Okay. So anyway, I was a very determined reader. Might not do well in school, but I was, I was home reading. Okay. And by the time I was in my senior year of high school, I had now really kind of began to hit my stride. And I did extremely well on my college boards so that I could get into almost any college and did. And went to University of Virginia and migrated from doing English into philosophy, which I got very interested in, and some math. And so, so tell me about a little more about the Charlottesville experience. So you started out as a, uh, you ended up a philosophy major. Or what was that? No, no, I started out as an English major. Okay. And the University of Virginia is a very a fraternity. Great school. Great school. It is a great school. It's very fraternity oriented. Yes. But I was not still acculturated. Is that the okay. word I want? I was you not. had better sense than stayed away from the fraternities, good for you. Uh, well, as it turns out these <laughs> days, yes. <laughs> the name has been blackened recently, but in those days it was a very party school. And okay. I was not against parties, but not, it just wasn't my crowd. No, so okay. I actually went to work in a, in a store and um, got, had a number of very country friends. And I got interested in country music about that okay. point. And I had a number of, Virginia is the home of bluegrass music. Right, right. So I had a number of friends that were fiddle players or guitar players, and I got very involved in music. And as a result of that curious event, I wound up having a roommate who wrote a number one song, a man named Paul Clayton, who wrote a song called Gotta Travel On, probably in 1960. Which and this was, is a country western bluegrass type yeah, song? It was a yeah. kind of countryish, okay. but it became a number one U.S. song. Oh, wow. Well, he was a few years older than me, but my roommate. And so that precipitated him into kind of running around the country and having musical friends. And I got involved in a. In oh, what a great experience. You're getting a college degree and in, uh, involved with me. Uh, music. It, was, yeah. it was interesting, yeah. And by then I was. I got. I did rather poorly for a while, and then I did very well, and I got in honors, which is exempted you from going to classes. You only had a private tutor. It was okay. a program for some students. Bright kids. What's a, a program for bright kids? Well, 
You're being modest, but it's true. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I did that, and my friend Clayton began to commute up to New York, and he got to be very friends with, this was the beginning of the great folk boom. Oh, good. So we're talking Dylan, Baez, that type of thing? Or well, yeah. just exactly. And okay. in fact, before long, he got to be friends with a guy named Dave Van Runk, who okay. was a big figure in the folk business, and living on Van Runk's sofa was Dylan, who had just arrived in <laughs> New York. You're kidding me. All right. No. So anyway, we got to be very good friends. Bob Dylan? Yeah. Heck, and stop the show. We'll talk Dylan all day. All right. Uh, so that you, we could. Now, you graduated at that point, or you're still in school? Um, oh, no, no, no. I'm no. still right in the middle you're, of college. You're right in the middle of going to college. Okay. No, but, I mean, we were... It got to be a kind of really nice thing. We would go to New York, and then he came and to... And you sh- knew New York, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah, no, as no. a youth, yeah. No, Dylan taught me to fry zucchini when you I was 19 it. years right. old. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm before, impressed. This was just sort of the first year he was getting famous. Now this is Dylan, the old Dylan, with this the guitar, is, singing, protest. When I say not so much protest, but uh, what are we, no, like, Joe Baez, yeah. the type of stuff, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. I mean, he was, he was a very funny, nice kid. And, okay. you know, it was, a, it was a very... Great experience, right? It was a great, great experience. experience. I, got, I went, actually, to Dylan's first Carnegie Hall concert in his limousine with him. And, you can't I mean, we were... All right. We were pretty good friends for a couple of years. People who don't like local politics, 10 million people are now watching the show because of Bob Dylan. Thank no, you. They, All right. It's the story pretty much ends there because Bob immediately got terribly famous and departed New York and Took was off. never seen again. But that had put me into a kind of circle of people, including this guy, Van Ronk, who was a... Now, pretty, Van Ronk was a producer type? Of, uh, no, actually, uh, he was kind of the most famous folk singer of the time in New York okay. City and a great kind of guru for all the folkies. Okay. And he and I got to be best friends, and I moved to New York and lived down the street from him. And in fact, we traveled around the United States for 15 or 20 me. years Terrific. now. Absolutely. Okay. Now, your um, role was friend, companion, or wor- work, working, no, or what? No, we were just or personal what? friends. Okay. By then, when I graduated from college, I had no idea what you did with a philosophy degree. <laughs> this is not a ticket to riches. No. So, I But went, a great degree, by the way. It is a, a nice degree. one, but I went to... Uh, I went to... Uh, <clears throat> New York and had no idea of what one did for a living and I looked in the newspaper and saw you could learn to be an executive okay. so before long I was working at a department store with your philosophy degree with my philosophy but Steve, before you let me leave because I've got yes. a lot of people going to get mad at me when they see me on the street yes. back to the Dylan and the Hootenanny I mean the Kingston Trio name me who would you Throw some names out. Uh, I mean, the Kingston Trio, that type of group. Or that was, no? They were that was a different. very commercial group that okay. had nothing to do with that scene. Okay. But in okay. fact, Baez was out of. She was one of the Boston folkies. There okay. were there were two groups of folk yeah, music. Educate us on that a bit, please. Yeah. Briefly, there's a Boston no. group, and that was Baez. There was Joe a Baez. Boston group, and that was Baez and. John Kerner, and there were a whole Eric von Schmidt. Oh. There were a whole crowd up there. But the real core of the game was the New York set New York because, City. because Dylan kind of anchored it and he took folk music in a whole new direction. Okay. Okay. Rather like the Beatles, he rather revolutionized how music was oh, being great. written. It oh. was a, what a great yeah. experience. There's a book was, there for you, right? Mm, if you haven't already written it, right? No, not, not yeah. no intention of. Anyway. It was, it, that didn't take all my time, but no. it kind of, you know, it was an interest. I was listening to a lot of music in great those stuff. days. Great stuff, yeah, great stuff. All right, so, so you yeah. jumped ahead and I, yeah. I, I cut you off. Yeah. Uh, philosophy degree, so you get into management and, okay, take I went to work that. at Lord & Taylor. Um, okay, great department store, yeah. It is, but it's not great to work at. That oh, okay. If you go to work in a department store, you will labor in the salt mines for years and years. What, what was the entry level <laughs> position? I mean, you have a college degree. I was degree. brought on as a so-called floor manager, which okay. puts you in charge of three aging and resentful <laughs> sales ladies. <laughs> it's Your first political <laughs> test. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was interesting. There weren't, it's normally a job that a lot of college girls, ladies do, and that I was okay. a unique guy selling bedspreads and curtains in Department 21. 
most of which we didn't have. And this anything. is New York City, I make sure. Yeah, oh, absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. I was on 39th and 5th oh, Avenue. Oh, great spot, great you know? spot. Okay. So I uh, uh, went to work there for a year, but it was, to call it a fast track to anywhere would <laughs> be not. very wrong. So I, one of the ladies I worked with had a sister who worked on Wall Street, and I went down there and talked to her, and the next thing I got, I still had this rather good degree in my pocket, so I was... Oh, UVA degree, it's a gold mine, right? Well, the honors part of it was. So anyway, I got a job in a, in a trust bank as a researcher. Okay. And that turned out to be kind now of... Now researching portfolios or stocks or... Actually, in those days, it was really a rather scholarly job. You, you, for a year, you basically just studied business okay rather on your own I mean brokerage houses had turned out thousands of reports and you were to read them and learn okay so I started studying banking and insurance companies but switched to energy companies because it seemed more interesting and I spent several years in that bank and then got hired away by another bank and went to work there as one of the... This is 60s? We're yeah, we're now, 60s, we're now creeping. Yeah. yeah, I went to okay. New York in 65, I guess. And okay. by the end of the 60s, by... Is that right? Yeah, about... Yeah, the end of the 60s, I was at work at F Fiduciary Bank, and I went to work there as a one of the very sub-portfolio managers in the United Nations Pension Fund. Oh, wow, that would have and been so interesting. And so I did yeah. that for a year and then stopped. Okay, New York scene, got tired of the New yep. York scene. And, no, I love New York, okay. but I didn't, at that point I was 30-something, and like all people who are 30-something, you've, you've never not worked. No, I mean, no. you go through school, and every year I worked in school, and you had a summer job, and you hopped over some interesting things because I wound up being a goat herder in Mexico one summer as a it's 16 fair. year this old. Is, this is not a joke. No, not this is a bit. No, okay. my parents probably correctly discovered that I was not or determined that I was not. My character needed strengthening. Okay. So I was sent to, they had friends that were in the wool business because we were in the wool okay. business who owned some big ranches along the Mexican border. And I went to uh, and spent one summer working on a ranch in Mexico with only Mexican workers basically herding sheep from, I guess, the beginning of June until September. And the Mexicans spoke no English, and I spoke oh, that no would have been Spanish. Fun. That and would have been fun. We lived in a house with no electricity. So this is after New York? No, right? this, no, 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 no. We jump back. That's I, all right. I, I That's decided okay. I'd leap you backwards okay. through That's time. Okay. Yeah, I did that one summer, and then... I've interviewed a lot of people, but not a goat herder. So well, I've been going, a huh? goat herder, oh, okay. and the next year I got an even stranger job with a Mormon and two Indians, I mean, American Kiowa Indians, yeah, okay. Luther Mink and a Mr. Ironcloud, riding in parts of Yellowstone Park to try to find places to take tourists, and we went on a 700-mile ride that lasted... Mm. I think it was like 35 days and never went in a building, and I was, you know, Sleeping by Sleeping under the stars? Huh? Sleeping under the stars. Oh, absolutely. Oh, great. Yeah, and okay. mosquitoes and freezing cold. <laughs> and so anyway, this... Good experience. Yeah, well, I don't know. Okay. At 16, it didn't seem like it. I wanted Negative. a convertible and a girlfriend, not, you know... <laughs> not to be a goat herder around. Yeah, the, no, I mean, yeah. it was... I, I, I needed to learn to be social, not okay. to learn to... And your parents had organized this? Both yes, of my them, parents, both of them. yeah, they were very thoughtfully. Oh, well, yeah. good for that. Now, that's, that's jump back. Okay, that's right. good. We're, anyway, in the, we're in New York City. I'm just trying to describe no, no, how this stuff. ongoing disaster no, no, happened. No, 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 that's great stuff. Now, now anyway, back to the bank, because right. that was a travel back in time, but... You're the United Nations helping with a retirement fund? Yeah, no, okay. no, I was one of, like, five. You, you were given, like... A, 50 million bucks or something. To and you were investing in their retirement money. Absolutely. Okay. And okay. it was sort of a, con what's the word I want, communal operation because we met every day and talked over what we were doing and what the market felt like and what we thought the good sectors in the market were. But by then I'd been in the market for five or six years. And I, this is a business you learn very slowly because you have to have a knowledge of 
world affairs, you have to be able to understand what the news of the international political life means, what the money supply means, what, you know, whether you're increasing, you know, whether we're in an inflationary period or deflationary. And anyway, that was the beginning of the stock market business for okay. me. All right. So anyway, along the way, we're now up to about 1970, I guess, or a little after. I, it, it is to be remembered that in those days, gold was not, you were not allowed to own gold. Right. And it was first permitted. It sold for was by law regulated fixed price at thirty-five dollars an ounce, and they freed it up. This had been since your man Roosevelt was in office. Okay, he put the freeze on. He put the and freeze Nixon on. took. Am I right? Nixon took it off, or LBJ? Yeah, yeah no, Nixon. 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 So anyway, about that time, I got interested in the gold trading business, and so I got involved in trading gold, and I made kind of a big hit doing that. So I decided that since I had worked all these years and, you know, you begin to think how I'd suffered and all the sure. years and the late nights that I would take a few months off. Well, so anyway, I got into gold when it was actually about 80 or 90 bucks an ounce and it went up to 150 and I got into mm. more and more and then it crashed back to 80 and damn near put me out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought. How could I have done this? What happened? Uh, were the hunts involved or were the hunts in silver? That's later that's, in that's the later. silver market. Okay. That what was happened? Why did we go? I mean, just to talk a little. Yeah, sure. Why did we go from 80 to 160 and back and forth? What happened? Gold, in those, gold in those days was, had a, it was understood in a different way than it is today. In those days, gold was an emergency hedge. Okay. And every time, if you had a day when the stock market was moving violently down, gold would automatically go up so because it was going gold. to be, it was a safe haven. Okay. As time has gone on, that safe haven quality or understanding of it has disappeared. And it, it later came to be an inflation hedge. And now that we have no inflation, or very low inflation. Gold has been a great peril to those who got in, and it was $1,900 an ounce hmm. a couple of years ago, and it's sitting rather lacklusterly at 1100 now. So it, it, it's a complicated thing. But anyway, I got involved in the gold business and decided on this that I was probably some sort of genius, and all I would do <laughs> is roll from one triumph money, yeah. like this to the next. Well, it was the last one I had that I got interested in the stock market too, and I kept at it, and I had a little money, and I sort of worked it uphill. And you're, and you're living in New York? I was still living, living in, in New York, okay, but okay. about this time when I was in my middle 20s, my father died, and we still owned this property here. My mother moved away to Vermont, and I began to commute here every weekend from okay, New York, and for right. 18 oh. years I commuted Every from weekend? Every weekend. You drove, you're driving or train or driving? No, every weekend okay. I would drive. I may be in 52, I might miss two, but hmm. I don't know why, but I, whenever I'd stay in New York, it just didn't. Uh, this, uh, you, got, you relaxed down here. You felt more, well, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't unrelaxed in New York. Okay, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a nice life, but, but having said that, I really liked it here, and so I did that for nine, 18 years, I guess, in about 1982 or three. I closed my apartment down in New York and moved here. Okay, and then this became permanent residence? Yes. Queen Anne's County. Okay, all right, yeah. okay. Now, when you're here, you're managing the Conquest Beach property, is that what you're doing? No. No, Not okay. A, I mean, once I did, we were, we had a farming business, like, I mean, it was a 500, 600 yeah, acre that's farm. that's a big deal, yeah. But years in the stock market and gold market told me that farming was a very very tough business and i didn't know enough about it to do a good okay. job at it so i rather quickly i think i we had farm machinery and planted and dug it up and i did that for six years but i smelled trouble okay. and so <laughs> i thought i'm going to get out That's of this somebody business. else wins, and, yeah and somewhere along the 1970s, we got into a rather inflationary period, and I got in my mind that it would be a good idea to have a small business. This is a okay. This bad, is when, with bad the idea a lot of yeah. people have. But okay. anyway, I decided that not only was a small business a good idea, but I liked the gourmet food business because okay. even in recessions, food always does well. Sure. It doesn't. People like to eat. 
people like these? So that <clears throat> I got involved, there was a, well, anyway, to make a very long story short, I got involved in raising pigeons. Okay. And that I started out with 600 and wound up. Are you raising them here to here? ship to New York yeah. and places like that? Exactly, right. yeah. I started out with a few hundred and wound up with 37,000 pigeons. pigeons. All I out mean, here, here in Queen Anne's County? Yeah, okay. Yeah, out there. Yeah, okay. I, right. I think it was the largest assembly of pigeons in in the United States at that point. Okay. Anyway, there's a lot of pigeons. For the uneducated, but help me out, for the uneducated, pigeon, we... Pigeons, their, their children are called squabs, okay. as you call veal, young. Anyway, squabs are 28-day-old pigeons. Okay. They're like Cornish game hens, and that they are very prized in European French cooking and in Chinese. Okay. The Chinese believe that if you eat pigeons on your wedding day, since pigeons mate for life that okay you, can, you mate for life exactly okay. so that you know eating squab known as buck up buck-op buck okay. all birds are op's so their ducks okay. are one op okay. and anyway eating buck up was a good thing so i began raising pig squab for chinese restaurants in new york oh, and wow. raised about one and a half million squabs you're, over the And you're next. shipping these up on a regular basis yeah. from Queen yeah. Anne's County? Oh, yeah. I didn't know the pigeons. That's interesting. Yeah. So okay. anyway, I did that, and we sold maybe 400 or 500 a week in Washington to the French Embassy and Watergate and a bunch of fancy restaurants. Right. And okay. it, it was a business that took a lot of work and never, it would make some money and then something would go wrong. It was sort of, you up know. Up and down. Up, up and down. down. And after 20 years of that, God, in one of his more sunny and happy <laughs> moods, sent a, a uh, an investor who wanted this business, and I was oh, you sold never okay. been more happy when to he, get rid of it. it. All the pigeons, goodbye. Uh, yes, it was the end. <laughs> okay. And now I could be a pure stock market guy. Okay. And about that time, some sort of odd twist of fortune also got involved, and I got in. I had some friends in Texas and that I uh, became kind of an unofficial and then official advisor to a very wealthy and prominent Texas family. And you were I doing had, investments for them when you say advisor. Well, yeah. at first I sort of, you ought to buy this and shouldn't buy that, but it grew into a, me working for them and okay. I have for years worked for this oh, good. Okay, one good. family. I have one, one client, one customer. Well, oh, good. Okay. We, and that's what you've been doing since the pigeons. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's a, it running as it's like a hedge fund. It, okay. I, I I rarely hedge, but we can, and uh, that uh, it's a pretty good size. It's about it the same busy. size as it's the same size as Queen Anne County's budget. So, oh, okay. Yeah, All I right. mean, we're in. The, it's full time. It's full time. It's a pretty good size business. And Stephen, look, we only got a couple minutes left. Just to catch us up to date. Yeah. And you've been since the '80s involved in the county with a million and one different, just reel off real quick for us, sure. having parks and all the different organizations you've been involved with. I had an airplane, and Bob Salit, who was a county administrator some years ago, got me on the, or put me on the county airport, airport board. And after a couple of years of that, I had somehow ascended to the president's or chairmanship of that, and it got taken into the park department. And I got on that board and became the, vice chairman of that and then I always liked animals and I have as you know many animals yes. so I got on the animal control board and did that for three or four years and stopped and then I went on I guess then I went on emergency services and I okay. did that for a bit so they saw you coming they just kept putting you on yeah. boards and stuff. Well, yeah. you did a good job right? I hope. You did. Yeah. They wouldn't so have asked anyway, you back. Yeah. It, it did give me a very lengthy 21-year experience in, I, I would say, operationally, what county government does. Okay. That a lot of other people get involved in county government because of an interest in land usage. That seems to be sort of the political right, right. hotspot, yeah. battleground of, of county political life. But my interest really wasn't that. I've always liked operational government, the sorts of things that deliver the playing fields, the ambulances, sure. the 
you know. Taking the, care of animals, whatever it might whatever be. Whatever it is, I like, I like to see that the operations end, and it, there's always, there are not so many people in that, and it's not very disputatious. Okay. It's just, can you do it Can well you do or, it? Yeah. Can you make sure the fields are getting cut? Can you make sure the airport landing and, strips and, are done? And yeah. these commissions, it's not so much that you're there needing to direct it, but what you need to do is to communicate with your commissioners what it is that they need to do, sure. how, how the funding should flow. And I got good at that. Good, good. So, and you helped the county out quite a bit. Well, you I did. Hope. You're too modest to say it, but I'll say it. Yeah. Now, so we're just about done, Stephen. We always end up with five fun questions, all right? And they're real fun. So just see if this is fun or not. Oh, no, you're yeah. going to like it. <laughs> if you could go anywhere in the world, I know you've traveled a lot. If I said to you, uh, Fred's got the power to send you anywhere, this is the fun part of the yeah. show, all right? Yeah. You go anywhere, someplace you haven't been, where would you go? I was about to say home, but... Oh, no, <laughs> that doesn't count. You stay there. Yeah. Anywhere in the world besides home. Uh, where would I go? Um, I'm actually, I've never been to Hawaii. It might okay. not be enormously adventurous, but I, it's a thing I've always had in mind to do. Okay, um, we'll get you to Hawaii. Yeah, please. Uh, next question. This, this was, I had fun with yeah. this with Jim Moran. His yeah. answer was everything. Favorite food? Mm, that's a good one. Oh... My cooking. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, maybe see, we'll try that next time. We'll yeah, do a show see, no, from I'm, your kitchen. You okay. know, after a number of years, I've gotten to be able Quite to make those it. things, which I, I want like. to try some of this pigeon. Yeah. That sounds well, good. Well, that's a, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, question three, yeah. and we ask this: If you could have dinner, okay, I can arrange again my magical powers as a sure. TV person here. Yeah. Have dinner with anybody in the history of the world. You can sit down at a table and just say the two of you sit and talk over a glass of wine and a little pigeon. Who would it be? Oscar Wilde. Okay, and why? That's good. Because he's a, absolutely probably the greatest conversationalist okay. you ever lived. You, Funny, you, smart, cheerful, and, and a, a, just an absolutely great conversationalist okay. and companion. All right. How about Brett um, Four? Uh, um, person or persons that had the most influence on your life? Huh. Can be family, friends, could be anybody at all. My father had an Irish friend named Crawford Norris, okay. and he was the man who brought twining tea to the United States okay. and started with nothing and made a fortune by owning the twining tea business in the United States. And, I, and twining tea I have in my tea at home, correct? Yes. The I, Irish, you Irish probably yes, do. I do. It's, I yeah, do. they have Irish breakfast. Well, anyway, right. yeah. the, when I was in World War II, there were no foreign teas for sale here. There was okay. We had Lipton's, but... Basically, he brought in gourmet teas, and he designed the packaging and made it, and he had no money and started this with nothing, and just on his sense of taste and, and wit and good humor, okay. he, he, he ran this business into a great thing, and I, I just thought he was terrific. I have a cup of his morning yeah. tea every morning. Come by, yeah. 10 o'clock with yeah. honey. Yeah. Okay, last question. If you could, yeah. in the next four years that you're commissioner, if there's one thing you could do for the county, whether it's a particular issue, what would, what would that be? I mean, if you had the power to be king for four years, and was there one thing you'd like to do? You know, there isn't a single thing because, you know, as they say of life, the devil always lives in the details. And what I do is to try to make the details work right. It's not a single issue. It's all the little sub-issues. If I could get them working along so that the county would operate, the ambulances came a little quicker, the schools had a little better, whatever they needed. It's a whole agenda of little things you'd like was, to get done. It was just an assembly of the minutiae of every, the bricks of everyday life that together make an environment nice. That would be it. And it's a sort of wishy-washy answer, but it's an answer. No, it's a good it's answer. A, okay. Yeah. Now, Steve, this wasn't bad, was it? I'd like well, to thank you for being with us, all right? Yeah. Let me sign off here. Uh, mm -hmm. My name's Fred McNeil. You've been watching mm -hmm. Fireside Chat. We've had mm -hmm. the pleasure of having Commissioner-elect Steve Wilson with us, and he knows everybody from Bob Dylan to the man who makes the tea I drink every morning. Again, Fred McNeil, my time's up. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time.